What's up, everybody? Today's topic is an awesome one because it's about enzyme kinetics. Every single enzyme in your body functions at reaction speeds that are absolutely astronomical. And to understand them, we have to understand Michaelis Menten and the line Weaver Burke plot. And that's exactly what today's question is about. So let's go ahead and read it. It says a line Weaver Burke plot is shown below for a particular enzyme. How will this plot change when a non competitive inhibitor is added? So the great part about this question is that it's going to combine chemical kinetics with inhibitors, all right? And that's massive. And the four answer choices have to do with the slope of this line. Will the slope of this line increase, decrease, not change, or you can, can you not determine it? So the main topic here is um, chemical kinetics, right? Because chemical kinetics is how fast reactions go, and that is a big part of the, of the, new, in, uh, of the new MCAT. And again, this is a really hard question, and those are the ones that are most fun to address. So let's get started. So, when we have a non-competitive inhibitor, what do I mean by that? Well, a non-competitive inhibitor is something, first of all, it's an inhibitor, right? So, an inhibitor is going to decrease enzyme function, all right? But more importantly, as an MCAT student and someone who's studying for the MCAT, you should know all the different types of inhibitors. There's competitive inhibitors, there's non-competitive, there's other types, but in this case, we know that a non-competitive inhibitor is something that binds at a location outside of the active site. Okay, so outside of the active site. So you know that the enzyme has an active site where things happen. So if you pretend like this is the enzyme, this is the active site, and that's where the substrate would go. In, in general, you would have the inhibitor, a non-competitive inhibitor, binding outside of the active site. When the inhibitor is bound, the enzyme can't catalyze the reaction it's supposed to catalyze. And that is um, absolutely a prominent aspect of a non-competitive inhibitor. So I have an image on the top right corner, top left corner of a non-competitive inhibitor. You'll see that the substrate binds at the active site and the non-competitive inhibitor binds at the region outside of the active site, right? And when this non-competitive inhibitor binds, it prevents this enzyme from catalyzing the reaction with the substrate. All right, let me write, let me say that again. When this non-competitive inhibitor binds, it prevents the enzyme from catalyzing the substrate uh, reaction. Right? And when what that means is basically when you have non-competitive inhibitors present, you have fewer active sites that can catalyze reactions. Right? You physically lose active sites because when this inhibitor is bound, this active site essentially becomes useless. This substrate is stuck and you can no longer um, kind of overcome this inhibition. All right? And because of this, what this means is when you add more substrate, you can't overcome the inhibition because the inhibitor is already bound and the substrate can't really change anything. In a competitive inhibitor, what you may know is that the competitive inhibitor competes with the substrate for the active site. And therefore, when you add a lot of substrate, you can overcome competitive inhibition. However, in non-competitive inhibition, the competitive in non-competitive inhibitor is binding in the region outside of the active site. And therefore, it, um, adding more substrate has no effect. All right, and if you know your Michaelis-Menten plots, you'll know that a normal normal Michaelis-Menten plot looks something like this, where as you add more substrate, the reaction will happen more quickly because the enzyme will end up re uh, catalyzing the reaction more quickly because there's a lot of substrate. However, when you have a non-competitive inhibitor present, what I'm trying to show you is that you're not only going to have a lower Vmax, which is the lower overall speed, you're going to have a lower overall speed because now, even when you add more substrate, notice that as you more, add more substrate, the Vmax is still super low because all of the enzymes that have the inhibitor bound are still inhibited. The substrate concentration will do nothing to relieve that um, inhibition. All right. So this is kind of mentioned right here. When you add more substrate, you're going to have no effect on Vmax okay? because of non-competitive inhibition. And so what ends up happening is because of that, because of that, right? I just showed you uh, that Vmax with the present inhibitor, the non-competitive inhibitor, what we're going to see is we're going to have something like this, right? We're going to have something like this. The blue line represents the non-competitive inhibitor. Well, when you have a non-competitive inhibitor, the Vmax, as you saw, decreases. So that is something that I already kind of explained to you. And the Vmax decreases because you have less of the inhibitor. I mean, you have less active sites present. So let me draw that with a better arrow. On the other hand, what happens to KM? So if you're, if you're into chemical kinetics, you need to know Vmax and KM, and you need to know what effect inhibitors have on both. Well, KM is the concentration of substrate when one half Vmax is reached, okay? And what I mean by this is we're looking for KM. So in, in, our, in our normal case, when we have red, when we have red, the normal 
no inhibitor present, you'll see that the KM happens at the point when we reach one half Vmax, which is right here, and that is the substrate concentration, and that therefore the KM value is right here, the substrate concentration at which you reach one half Vmax. However, what about when you have a non-competitive inhibitor? What happens to the KM? Well, what you'll see is a non-competitive inhibitor lowers the Vmax, right? Then this is the new Vmax, if you want it to really be precise, right? Well, therefore, because it lowers Vmax, it's also going to lower one half Vmax appropriately. And believe it or not, what that does is you have one half Vmax occurring at a lower value. And because you have one half Vmax occurring at a lower value, everything is basically downgraded by the same amount, and therefore your Km value is staying the same, all right, is constant. Your Km value does not change when you add a non-competitive inhibitor, because even though Vmax changes, one half Vmax changes by the exact same amount, and therefore one half Vmax happens at precisely the same point at where it would have happened before. And so those are the overall changes. So now, how does this translate to the line weaver burke plot? Because what I've been talking about so far, and this is again should be review, is what I showed you was the Michaelis Menten. Michaelis, I don't even know if I spelled this right, so forgive me if I didn't. But this is the Michaelis Menten plot, which is a, a very important part because substrate is on the x axis and velocity is on the y axis, and it kind of shows you how this works. And as I mentioned to you, when you have a normal enzyme, you have this first graph, which I'm labeling one. When you have a competitive inhibitor present, you'll have the same Vmax but a different KM. And I'm not going to talk about that. Maybe I'll make a different video about it, but don't worry about it if you don't get it. On the other hand, what I do want to emphasize now is this bottom part right here. When you have a non-competitive inhibitor, you'll see that you have the same KM, a different Vmax, and more importantly, you have a lower Vmax. All right? So with that being said, let's go ahead and move on to answering this main question, which was, how does this translate to a line weaver burke plot? Well, in a line weaver burke plot, notice that in Michaelis Menten, you had velocity on the y-axis and substrate on the x-axis. You're now going to take the one over those things. When you take the reciprocal of the axes, you get a line weaver burke plot, and everything that you had as this, um, this, I don't even know what shape this is, but I'd say like a logarithmic graph, everything you had in that shape turns into a linear graph. All right, and the cool part about line weaver burke is that the x intercept in a line weaver burke is negative one over km, and the y intercept is one over v max. Right, that's the great part about line weaver burke. Okay, and you should be really familiar with both of these. And now let's put everything together. Now remember, a non-competitive inhibitor is going to decrease our v max, and it's going to have no change on our km, aka km is going to stay exactly the same, and therefore. The, the line weaver burke, as I mentioned to you, look at this line weaver burke. The x intercept is negative 1 over km, and the y intercept is 1 over v max. And the slope in a line weaver burke, if you want to take the slope, is km over v max, right? And if you think way back to the first slide of this, I asked you, how does the slope of the line weaver burke plot change when a non competitive inhibitor is added? Well, let's, let's do this hypothetically. Hypothetically, let's say without the inhibitor, our Km was 5 and our Vmax was 10. If that was the case, then our slope would be 1 half because we know that slope is Km, KM over Vmax on a, on a line weaver burke. But when we have an inhibitor, what do we say happens to the Km? Well, when we have a non-competitive inhibitor, Km stays the same and Vmax decreases. So let's say Vmax decreases to 5. Then what you'd see is that the slope eventually becomes 1. So regardless of what you said the Vmax goes down to, you'll see that the slope increases. And therefore, the overall answer here is that when you add a non-competitive inhibitor, as you can see with this graph, the slope increases in a line weaver burke plot. I hope you guys got a lot out of this. It's a very intricate, convoluted problem. Nonetheless, very important to conceptually understand chemical kinetics, something that's happening in your body every second of every day. With that, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I'll see you again next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching the video. Really appreciate it. You want to check out any of my other videos, there's going to be one right here. Another link to one of my videos right here. And another video right here. Why not? I'll put one video right over here. And last but not least, if you want to subscribe to this channel, really appreciate it because I'm still an early YouTuber trying to get it down. But a subscription button should be right over here. So please subscribe. Cool. Thanks. See you guys in the next one. Hope you find these videos helpful.